Everybody wants to know, how is this? And this? Considered to be in the same musical universe, let alone the same genre. Let's get into it. Now it's time to talk about the groups of people that initially formed this online music scene we now call hyperpop. Let's just get this one out of the way. In 2012, British producer A.G. Cook started a Tumblr music blog called Gamzanite, which released music from artists who ended up on the online label PC Music in 2013. Friday night, time to get drunk. Go, go to the party, time to get drunk. Arrive in the clear game, driven by a hunt. Straight to the bedroom, driven by a hunt. Obviously, PC Music is undoubtedly up there. They're continuously going to be, because they're arguably the most prolific influencer of, of, of this genre. Especially with like PC music, most people didn't really understand it, but with the benefit of hindsight, you kind of see that they did help to break down those boundaries between, you know, more experimental kinds of music and pop music. When PC music was starting to gain a lot of traction and was starting to get all these like think pieces and just bullshit written about them, where it's like, are they serious or are they not? It's, I mean, they are as far as you want to take it. PC Music's legacy is well documented, and the label still holds significant cultural importance to this day in the worlds of experimental pop and electronic music. They took more or less each and every one of the genres mentioned in the last video and mixed, twisted, and pushed them into new territories. In the process, they redefined modern music production and consumption. Never really tried to push PC Music as the future, I see it as maybe a more transparent and maybe even a more aggressive version of the present. Their SoundCloud DJ mixes, the fake aliases that were actually just AG Cook and maybe one other artist, and signed artists such as GFOTY, Hannah Diamond, Danny L. Harl, Kane West, aka Gus Lobin of KKB, Spiny, and Easy Fun remain legendary in the hyperpop scene. I don't know if there was really the space in really commercial music for this. The thing about PC music was that there were all these DJs. These yeah. random DJs yeah. that were actually just AG Cook with a new face, or yeah. AG Cook and Easy Fun, or AG Cook and Felicita, like lip gloss twins. Attaching it to an idol, which we often do in pop music, was less important. With PC music, you remove the importance of like an artist and what an artist means. And all of a sudden, it's just like a direct link between the music and, and the audience. And it removes that sort of ego of the artist. That's gotten lost completely, I think. I thought it was cool finding out it was all him because I was like, wow, that's impressive. But now it's kind of just like, OK, so uh, they got all these uh, they got these new artists on PC music, huh? These guys, yeah. uh, they're really making music, huh? Mysteriousness, artsiness, aesthetic cohesiveness. I think the reason the label was so wildly successful is because he yeah, Cook had a vision. The label's collaborations with Charlie XCX and historical association with Sophie helped skyrocket hyperpop into the greater cultural consciousness. And it's seeing like PC music, so then they enter the industry and influence it in very direct ways. The these sensibilities that were around on SoundCloud and Tumblr is playing out now in pop culture because these people who are like into it have entered the industry. Remember when Charlie XCX did all the Vroom Vroom stuff and I was like, oh, this is going to be huge. This is going to be like the mainstream pop. And then it wasn't. But a couple years later, now it is. Like now it's the, that's the palette. That's the way that people listen to music. Even before PC Music was the Sheffield, UK-based label Off Me Nut Records, which was formed in 2010 and was where artists like Fat World and SpongeBob SquareWave embraced genres like breakcore, donk, and happy hardcore. Off Me Nut was the start for producers like Tom Parker, who made music for the label under the Daddy Long Legs alias, and went on to produce for hyperpop artists such as Dorian Electra and GFOTY as Count Baldor. 
But importantly, Afmina also represents an early reference point for internet music and hyperpop's adoption of rave styles, both as a sonic choice and as a turn away from the moody techno scene to an embrace of something looked down upon by conventional club goers and dance music listeners. Something happier, faster, sillier. Manicure Records, an Edmonton-based label founded by Tom Mike, who also goes by their stage name Ghibli, is in many ways the North American nightcore-heavy parallel to Britain's PC music. I think Manicure Records was very inspirational to me. That's how I found out about Nightcore. I was like, what is this? Wait, oh my God, this is Taylor Swift sped up, but it sounds so good like this. And all this other SoundCloud Nightcore stuff happened because of Manicure. So I, I first found Manicure Records on SoundCloud in like maybe 2014 or something. And Ghibli had approached me and that was like, it blew my mind. Cause up until this point, like I hadn't been involved in club music or like the rave scene or anything like that in real life in like a personal sense. So to have that connection through the internet was interesting. For me, I was very into the idea of representation, like seeing other gay, seeing other queer people sort of making really cool art and doing really cool shit. And then also uh, just playing with aesthetics and playing with how far you could push things visually and sonically. Manicure Records embodied many of the sonic elements we now ascribe to Hyperpop. Having branded most of their output on SoundCloud with hashtag manicured, the label became a symbol, an aesthetic and philosophical aspiration for artists with a similar approach to dance music and a rejection of heteronormative club culture. Tom Mike said as much in a 2014 interview with Freak Mag. It's not about saying fuck straight white cis men. It's more about that we can create this kind of music and this scene and this attitude and it can be not heteronormative at all whatsoever. It can be fun. It can be queer. It can feature people of color at the forefront. It can be everything. This inclusive environment has, obviously, played a massive role in defining hyperpop culture to this day, despite the label ending years ago. Zoom Lens, a label founded by the artist Meishi Smile in 2009, is, reductively, an experimental pop and electronic online label. But look closely and you can see the early seeds of what many consider the hyperpop ethos. It's smart to actually include uh, Zoom Lens into this whole hyperpop narrative, right? I've known Faye, the label head, for a long time with, with Meishi Smile exploring J-pop influences in their music. I would argue that that contributed to more deconstruction of what pop music is. And I think to tie it to, to hyperpop, it, it's about the ethos. It was like digital punk rock. Punk in the sense that we use the tools that we have with our own cultural latching points and mixing it all together, just freely expressing ourselves. Oh, yeah. Zoom Lens was another huge one that like, actually Zoom Lens is the reason like I moved out to California. I was in Arizona and I came out here in 2014 and went to a Zoom Lens show. At the time, you know, with Hyperpop, everything was on the internet. And being in like a physical like building with like all of these people that care about the thing I cared about, I was like, I have to leave Arizona. Like this is a nightmare. I started making music around like 12 years old and I fell into the Zoom Lens crowd pretty quickly. And that kind of catapulted me into internet music in general. I love May She Smile so much. May She Smile is like such an important moment in time for me when I first discovered their music and still such an important artist to me. Zoom Lens too. You know, Meishi at that point wasn't even even sure about what kind of political mandate they wanted Zoom Lens to be. It was just like, we're gonna put, I'm gonna put out my music and put out my friends' music. We're gonna make cool stuff, and we're gonna like have this like tear shit up ethos about it. And we're just like not give a fuck what people think about what we're doing. And I think that was such a, a needed thing at that point. Mainstream music was so corporatized. Uh, that was like Geek Festival, right? And we just needed kids at like house shows, like thrashing and banging on shit. That, then that was like it. Internet music became it.
Zoomlens's roster, which consists of former and current artists such as 4L, U Pistol, Mark Redito, DJ Obake, and Meishi themselves, represents a bridge formed via the internet between various countries, particularly from East Asia, and their international diasporas. This in turn reflects the label's characteristic, genre-expanding approach to all sorts of music styles, and the boundaryless notions of online music distribution and community. May she smile in an interview with Red Bull Music Academy in 2014, said, We are a collective of musicians, humanity across the digital divide. Digital punk rock spirit. Fuck real life. You also have the Japanese-based net labels Maltine and Trekkie Tracks. Trekkie Tracks, with artists like Car Painter, was huge for the underground rave scene in Japan. And the music that came from Maltine Records, with its curation of heavily J-pop and Shibuya K inspired electronic music, had arguably the largest impact on the hyperpop and internet music sound throughout most of the 2010s. Hyperpop would be nothing without J-pop. It's Maltine Records. I would definitely say that that was the biggest inspiration on my sound, uh, that record label specifically. Finding Maltine, and then specifically finding Tomga, just having my fucking mind transformed. I was like, you can make music like this? <laughs> it was like, I, like, of course you can. Like, this touches on so many things I like about music and just combines them into one, like, beautiful, ball of energy. I, I've never been able to write anything to their level because I view them as just like this progenitor of amazing art. Yeah, if you like intro music, you might all Maltina. I mean, I think Maltina was the peak internet label. They touched everything, right? And the idea wasn't that like, you know, it was a genre or something. It was just curation. It was pure curation, right? We put out what we think is good. And that was like the idea behind the internet music. Everybody's just going to put out what they think is good. I think Maltine Records and Trekkie Tracks are the main sources of like underground electronic music coming from Japan. It was interesting for me to hear early Maltine stuff use the same electronic understandings of the West, you know, from, from techno to house to like dubstep. Um, and, and sort of infusing it with their own like cultural understandings of music and, and scales and, and melody and then mashing them together and then it becomes this like really fresh thing the, the, the production feels familiar but then there's something in there that feels very at least to me feels very Japanese Artists like Tofu Beats, Park Golf, Tom Gu, and Evek Evek are hugely influential. One of Maltine's biggest lasting legacies, though, actually came from UK-based artist Bowen, whose 2013 album Pale Machine is massively listened to and revered to this day. He works very closely with uh, Kero Kero Benito and um, PC Music and people like that. He essentially created this amazing album that was like Shibuya K, it was a little bit dancey. He was combining all these different sort of elements in his music. His album has like millions of views on YouTube at this point. I think it influenced a lot more than I think people really talk about now. And it's fine that they didn't talk about it because his music lives on in like, people who listen to it and are influenced by it and stuff. I released an album in 2013 on Maltine Records. Um, yeah, that kind of just exploded from nowhere, basically. And like, it's still kind of going today. It's very weird. Like, yeah. people will be like, oh yeah, I've just like discovered this song that is now nearly like eight years old kind of thing. Acting as the, it's new music that like, is avant-garde youth music thing. But I'm like, I'm 29 and yeah, it's very odd. The regenerative lifespan that this album has had. I listened yeah. to music that was released on Maltine, and that's yeah. why I approached them was like, I really want to release on you guys. So like one artist that I then collaborated with on Pearl Machine was Avec Avec, mm -hmm. who was like the biggest influence for me at the time. Yeah, like Avec Avec's music. It had just this real vibrancy while also being technical, also just being really, really satisfying to listen to. <laughs> Yeah.
or I've found a Vecca Vecca and then seen this Mountain A Records thing and saw it maybe as like an accessible Twitter space where I could just send a message to one of these people and there was some entrance way. Mountain A is just this kind of like hotel where yeah. one of the residents is just this this person that I like. Okay, I can like try and stay at this hotel or something. <laughs> um, my, my kind of hypothesis was that if I make songs that instead of verse, chorus, and then like, oh, recognizable second verse, and then chorus two, and like, okay, I get it, you're satisfied. I thought if I made it where it was like, A, B, C, D, E, um, it's over. Okay, next song, A, B. It was kind of more like an amnesiac kind of way of making music where you're constantly in the present moment and Basically every section is a chorus and it's never going to come back. Like my hope was that like by taking away like the internal repetition structurally, I could encourage people to listen to it more in a kind of weird addictive way, trying to satisfy that urge. Back in the States, you can find Desk Pop, a label founded by Floor Baba in 2015 and currently run by Braz OS. I would be like submitting demos to record labels and not getting anything back from them. And I, I knew that what I'm doing is good. So I was just like, all right, fine. If nobody's going to give me a shot, I am going to seize the opportunity and I'm going to give myself this shot and I'm going to give other people this shot because I know that there's more people out there like me. I started that label as a way to like just kind of get us all working together, get us all in a, a singular audience and share exposure and stuff like that. Uh, through Desk Pop, then I was able to build a bigger sense of community and kind of give people opportunities that I didn't have. I think Desk Pop has been really important, particularly in the underground, like kind of, I, I don't want to say behind the scenes aspect of Hyper Pop. A lot of smaller artists, for instances, that have either come through Desk Pop or like no Desk Pop. There, there are a lot of internet and IRL connections with people in desk pop and I, I I honestly think they like don't get a lot of recognition that they deserve. They've historically been home to more of the chiptune digital fusion side of things but have smoothly transitioned into this new era and remain a central figure in the internet music and hyper pop community. They've released music from scene mainstays such as Ivy Hollyvana, Galen Tipton, aka Recovery Girl, Nell Word, That Andy Guy, and Space Candy. Then there's Hyperpop Records, founded in 2016, which initially started as a collective of seven artists, including Cosmo Cosmo, Shady Monk, Fraxium, Water Spirit, Aki Boshi, Toasty, and Nova Drops. The collective played a hand in diffusing that term around the internet music scene. I've gone this whole time without actually mentioning, you know, Hyperpop Records. I feel like they got, just got, they kind of got dumped on, if we're going to be honest. Like, <laughs> this label came out of nowhere, and like, they've been sitting here this whole time calling themselves Hyperpop. And I'm like, you know, it fits because the most music I hear from that label is like really like hyper and, you know, somewhat poppy. So a lot of the Hyperpop stuff that you hear come out is just like, uh, you know, that's cool and all, but that's, it's not as hyper as this music right here with the actual label that's that's called a hyper pop. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of bugged me a lot. We can't we can't forget them. There was a label called Hyper Pop, Hyper Pop Records. And I remember like that was something I was shooting to get on as Kid Trash in 2016. Like that's what I wanted to be on. But I was so confused when the Spotify playlist popped up. I was like, I swear this name used to be a label. Like I I had a label called Hyper Pop and years later this happened. I'd be I yeah, I'd feel away. Maybe tail end of 2015, early 2016, I was kind of just starting to try to make the most of SoundCloud, started realizing a lot of these groups forming and people making collectives. And I was like, that seems cool. Like, it seems like a good way to be part of a community and be active with like a group of like-minded people. Seven of us founded the label, myself included, and the term future base was much more the thing that we were focused on, like trying to make. And, you know, even to this day, that similarly defies easy definition. It's kind of just like 
new electronic music that sounds fresh and crazy and genre bending. And it's like, if you can genre bend and sound cool and catchy and like it all sounds well produced, then it's feature based. In the world of SoundCloud, I was putting out songs and then I met Ayakita and Water Spirit. Water Spirit now, amazing hardcore artist. I'm so proud of them. But at the time we were all still like kind of finding our sound. They reached out to me and they were like, hey, we're kind of working on this collective. We're wondering if you wanted to join. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Jumped into like a Twitter group chat. It was it was a nice little little pod of us. There was yeah. there's seven of us and what are we gonna call this thing? And you know, it's it's funny, we, we were kind of tossing around names, but then I just pitched like, yo, I'm tagging all my tracks hyperpop, let's just do that. And everyone was super on board with it. Shady made like this beautiful logo really quickly because they're like just incredibly talented and can do anything that they put their minds to and if you go back and listen to any of the hyper pop tracks there's no like cohesive genre i think yeah. it's very just like eclectic sounds and it's it's not pop but it's not not pop i don't know right. what the i don't know what the hell you'd call it it's a really interesting evolution of all of it like i I hope in a way we did play our own kind of part in creating maybe like a baseline platform for people to build this like magnificent structure on top of, but I don't really think there's a way to know that. And you know, on the surface of it, it's, it's for me, the frustration of people not knowing the difference. Oh, suddenly I'm getting submission requests constantly from people who think I'm just supposed to be playlisting them and like, they were, they're wondering how to get on the Hyperpop playlist on Spotify. And I'm just like, I'm not the guy. It's this weird thing of perseverance through the fact that I know without a shred of doubt that clearly millions maybe of people listen to that playlist on Spotify and probably 1% of them know, if, if even 1% of them know about Hyperpop as a label. So it sucks to kind of like be like, hey, we were here first and people are just like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> We all knew, you know, Frax would be pushing it and doing all these cool things and how their ideas at the time were like a little further than kind of what they were maybe capable of. But then they'd all of a sudden come in with this new thing and you're like, you just advanced like 10 years. How did you do that? It hasn't changed. They're just continually pushing that envelope and doing this. They're carving their own path, which is what we all expected of them all the time through a number of different things we kind of started to go our separate ways i just like felt like we put too much effort and stock into it to like see it kind of just like fizzle out i've never been in it for like any kind of personal monetary gain i think i just have a really big passion for music community curation if i could put it that way now more of a broader net label run by co-founder shady monk hyperpop records still releases music from all corners of the electronic music in hyperpop umbrella just try to like continue to promote a space for mutual creation like bringing people together and seeing how like-minded talented people put stuff together to make stuff that's just super awesome that wouldn't have existed before you also had collectives like rora a relatively smaller group that fermented the early starts of artists like guppy and foley I was Sonder. I was like 16 and I wrote this song Departure under that name and it was the first thing we put out on the label and it like blew up. I think it was because someone made an anime music video of it. I think it has like two almost three million plays right now on YouTube. That, that was just like such a fluke, I feel like. It was such a like out of nowhere, you know, it was like mid 2014, 2015, 16, like Future Bass was huge. Everyone loved Porter Robinson. And so that's what I was like riding off of. Um, it's funny too, I feel like a lot of this scene has come from that era, that like Porter Robinson Worlds era. It was so like DIY, right? Like it, it's insane to me that people even remember Roar because we just felt, I, I always felt like we were one of the millions of collectives at that time. That. And, and we were, I mean, we were like that. I mean, there were so many.
There are ultimately too many of these collectives and net labels to name, but a few more I'd like to highlight are Chicago's Palettes, Britain's Com Records, and Australia's Sidechains. Outside of the collectives and labels themselves is the online community network that fostered the development of hyperpop. Social media, URL shows, tiny chat shows. These were formats where artists and fans alike interacted with each other. Uh, there was like all these like spaces, I guess is the best term. But it was like you would go from one, like you would leave the Radio Jack live stream or whatever, and you'd go into like SPF 420. And it was like all the same people. It's like, oh, I know that person. They don't even make any music. They don't do, we don't even know what this person looks like. We don't know where they live, but we know their username. It's pretty consistent. And we like see them on SoundCloud, we see them on Twitter. Like kind of anybody could come. Like anybody was like allowed in. And I think it was so socially focused. Like even today in 2021, there's a lot of people that I still talk to. And if I like think about it too hard, I'm like, why do I talk to this person? It's like, I don't know. They like tweeted something about an artist I like five, six years ago, and they had like a memorable username. And now we're like hanging out and getting boba. And it doesn't make any sense really, but it's like, oh, Hyperpop friends. A rolling scene, right? Like, you know, every, everyone has mutuals. It's like any industry. All the truck drivers around the country kind of know each other. There was yeah, something really special about that scene. I remember going to like Jack shows and you go to like an EDM show in New York and it's all about people who just want to get like on stage or backstage and you know, all this sort of clout chasing or something. I feel like for a moment, there was a space where people just were genuinely passionate about the music and having fun. Even back in 2016, when we were all capable of doing live shows, they were few and far between because the scene was fairly small. So we did a lot of internet shows. Like now, you know, people are like doing like DJ streams on Twitch and it's cool to do URL shows because COVID, but like there was no COVID in like 2013. We just weren't allowed to play shows because like no one liked our music. <laughs> it's really crappy, like really bad, like sound quality, but we were all playing and everybody was excited about getting home, going into my room and like turning on my computer to watch it. Data Fruits, SPF 420, Tiny Chat, all these online shows, super like almost like, again, like anti boiler room, like, like, like kind of fuck boiler room, kind of fuck corporate streaming just being online on the freest, shittiest platforms and doing the weirdest, lowest bit rate shows we could do, but like having a hell of a time and actually like gleefully laughing when it all breaks down because there's just too many people on the server or something like that. And these community elements are so integral to the Hyperpop story because they laid the philosophical foundations of, hey, we don't care who you are or what kind of music and art you make. This is a space for everybody, which one could presume influenced a contemporary Hyperpop canon that's defined by a lack of genre and identity boundaries. The sounds are just as important as the people. You get lumped into Hyperpop based on the general community you interact with online, not the music you produce. For many, this idea of interactive online music connection began with Turntable FM. Turntable FM was a website founded in 2011 that allowed you to create a DJ room where users, represented by avatars, could join, up or down vote the mixes you were curating, and then interact with each other in chat. I think Turntable FM was like a huge place to formulate a lot of this ideas back in the day. Because even if you couldn't throw a show, you could just like hop into a group chat with like five friends and like, we're going to go on Turntable FM. And then everybody would just like, everyone Turntable FM. And then soon you'd have an audience of like 400 people, like, and you're just playing like crazy frog remixes and stuff. And everybody's just like, yeah, that's great. Like, that's, that's hyper pop. That's hyper pop. <laughs> right? The much beloved site shut down in 2013, but is resurfacing as we speak. SPF 420 was a natural offshoot of Turntable FM, and was a space that specifically nurtured the early hyperpop community. Founded by Liz and Chaz Allen, SPF 420 produced online, live performance festivals on TinyChat, which allowed viewers to simultaneously talk with each other and watch the show. <laughs> SBF420, like, I don't think there would be a hyper pop scene without them. I think they were instrumental in creating an online music community at all, to be honest. 
combining all these like different genres of artists and putting on the same lineup and, and creating like little personalities for themselves, making cool visuals and making community around it. I was very into SBF 420 and mm. Tiny Chat shows that was the big start of me being like, okay, I want to be like a musician and I want to be on the internet. You know what I mean? I felt most at home in the digital space and I saw how fun people made it, right? So, so many people made it so fun. So it's like we were in a little house together and everyone's bouncing ideas off of each other and getting inspired watching people perform. A lot of us were very, very socially awkward, anxious teens mm. or in early 20s and we didn't want to go outside and we didn't want to talk to real people outside and we love to chat and to type and to, uh, you know, use a lot of emoticons. <laughs> if I could just go back, if I could just go back one time, I would... Uh. I wanted to do a fake festival that was like a it was like a joke you know it was like SPF 420 festival it was a joke that everyone was making that it turned into a turntable FM room I didn't we weren't even making the joke first then we kept going okay and then we kept going and then we wanted to create the, the world's first virtual music venue this was the world's first virtual music venue yeah. not not boiler room where it's like th that's a club you know what I mean that's a that's called a club and then we're just watching in a chat. No, this is the party. We're throwing the party online, yeah. not watching a party. I don't want to watch a party. I want to like be a part of a party. The roots of hyperpop were born in SPF 420 as a sort of amalgamation of different sounds and irony. You know, internet music. Really, I would call. I would have called it all SPF 420 like shit because. It was, that's what we were doing. We were blending it all together. These shows brought together artists from all over the electronic music spectrum, from vaporwave to footwork to trap, and hosted formative artists like St. Pepsi, AKA Skylar Spence, DJ PayPal, XXYYXX, Ryan Hemsworth, Tobacco and Black Moth Super Rainbow, and many, many others. Unfortunately, due to the immense amount of work required for these shows and the little amounts of income created, SPF 420 had to shut down in the middle of the decade. But it did resurface in 2020 in the midst of a global pandemic and onslaught of virtual concerts to recapture the spirit of online shows and remind everybody how special they were. And up next, one of our our longtime friends and favorite performers, XXYYXX. The 2020 show and its stack roster reflect just how important SPF 420 was and remains to the community and how its existence continues to reverberate within the very fabric and identity of hyperpop. In SPF 420's absence, the net radio site datafruits.fm has attempted to retain the eclectic and experimental spirit of internet music. Datafruits has kind of become a grease bucket for all the people who are sliding off the George Foreman grill that is corporate hyperpop and like collecting everybody who's like doesn't have real space to go. Super for the people, super accessible. I think Datafruits is like the least curated thing. Mm -hmm. I think Tony is just super just like, hey, that's cool, do it. Let's do a show, you can do it this time, cool. Mm -hmm. Go for it, here's how you do it. And it's just like, anybody can do anything. And those are beautiful things to me. Those are beautiful, ne necessary things to me. Then there were the Jack Shows, an international concert event founded by graphic designer Simon Wybray and was also a radio show on NTS called Nonstop Pop. So if SPF 420 was in the digital realm, although they did do some IRL shows, I feel like Jack was the physical you know, representation of that internet music community during that time. It was like the punk show. It, it was like that basement show. Simon, who started Jack, they are a graphic designer. So, so there, there's great understanding of color, 
of typography. The the show posters were were, were designed were, were very much like when you see it. At least for me, when you see it, it's like oh, I know what kind of sound is is going to be played there. You know, the kind of pinnacle event was like Jack L.A. Going to the show, going to this place, and meeting all of these people for the first time, like people you just know by their SoundCloud profile picture and their like Twitter display name. Mm. Seeing them and like you know giving them a hug, listening to their set, we were all just there to party. We were all there to have a really good time with our friends. And the weirdest thing about that environment is this is the first time you're meeting your friends. You'd think you know, oh, I'm nervous. I'm going to be meeting these people for the first time, but that doesn't really exist. You walk in and it's like, oh, Cosmo, Cosmo, what's up, man? And then other people are like, oh, yo, I want to meet them. And it's a very surreal feeling. I've I'd never felt anything like that before or uh, in a lot of ways since. It was fucking wild. It was the first time I'd ever seen internet music played in real life. It's like they all know who the musician is who's playing and they all know the song and it's it's probably how people felt like when they were watching the Beatles back in the day, honestly. Like, it was incredible. I think the original fundamentals of the See Me Know Today probably came with non-stop pop jack radio kind of thing where, okay, this is where we're actually having some kind of movement that feels sort of more coherent. There's definitely a community of people who are really dedicated to pop sound with also incorporating with other sort of like wacky elements like hardcore and dubstep and like just any kind of genre you can think of, you know? I really should went to New York just to like actually go to that show and like see a bunch of my online friends and stuff. <laughs> I felt like I found my tribe of people. I felt like I could connect a lot with these people musically and just in terms of who they were, especially as a queer person, I was like, wow, I really feel like these, these people represent me and other queer people really well. Yeah. The whole Jack scenes were a huge part of what I think is the foundations of like, at least a certain corner of the hyper pop scene. Having that radio show and those live shows was like, this is, you know, like this is your your world as an artist. Like you, you it felt like, okay, this is what where I musically belong. And so when Jack wasn't really a thing anymore, I know like personally, I was like, oh, well, <laughs> where do I fall now? We're here. We're here. Where are we at? Where are we at? What's this? Jack LA. Jack attempted a transfer of the almost utopian sensation of internet music connection into a real physical space. Everything about the community, from the music itself, to the friendship, to the unabashed be-yourself attitude, was sought out at a Jack show. Jack shows were not perfect, with stories floating around of broken equipment and insufficient artist payments. But what they represented in terms of cementing a community was seemingly invaluable. There's no pretending. We're all weird. We're all stoked. Jack is the best show you can play. You're going to hear some of the most interesting and dynamic pop music you've heard in your entire life. I also want to talk about Nest HQ, the Skrillex-founded publication that, with the help of DJ journalist Nightcore Affectionato fanfiction, was a primary source of coverage for this hyperpop community. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, RIP, right? Nest HQ had a big contribution to, you know, underground alternative electronics. They, they had open ears and, you know, I, I really appreciate that they even covered some of my, my own tracks. Nest HQ, before it shut down, was definitely like one of the places that first started reporting on it, like started reporting on things like Nightcore, on like Jack, on things like that. His name was Fan Fiction. So he was a journalist at Nest at the time, and he was the main one like reporting on all this stuff at the time. And I think he was not instrumental. We definitely played a big part on like making that scene gain a bit more notoriety and like more mainstream kind of press. Nest was connected to Skrillex, which was kind of like EDM royalty. And so this thing that was related to him was like talking about like a lot of like hyper pop stuff, scene stuff. Like I got like a, a write up in it, like homies got write ups in it. And like, it was nice to see that fanfic got out. Yeah, like right up, like right towards like the, I mean, the death. I mean, I always say the death of hyper pop and I, it like bumps people out, but like the death of hyper pop, what it was then 
Like a few people did like just straight up disappear. And he is one of them. I have no idea where that dude, I hope he's happy wherever he is. Yeah. I think in terms of like documenting it, it's, we're at a point where a lot of the documentation has been lost already. Fan fiction was trying to put a lot of this on and then Nest HQ is, I think they're no longer a thing. Their site is down and none of those articles are on the internet anymore, so. I bring up Nest HQ and fan fiction because as has been said, Hyperpop is more than just the music. It's the community that surrounds it and the visibility to one another for which community creates. Nest HQ is dead. Jack is dead. SPF 420 doesn't appear to be returning to what it was. These centralizing elements have disintegrated, which threatens the sense of connection these artists felt through them, as well as the prosperity of this rich history, especially because communities, genres, they evolve. And what is considered hyperpop now is in some ways a far cry from what it was, a new beast.